You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Please turn now to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And when you found your place, let's pray together before we begin. Our gracious Father, we are grateful to you for what you have provided for us in your word, that it is a source of truth, and it is the eternal and living source of truth. And we thank you that your word does a work in our hearts whenever it is preached, whenever it is sung, whenever it is read. We thank you that your spirit does that work. And so we pray that you would sanctify us in the truth this morning. And help us to think clearly and Christianly about all the things of which we are reading today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The passage that we read at the beginning of the service today, Romans chapter 1, describes the downward spiral of a man or a group of men and women, a culture, a nation, a church, whatever it is, that rejects God's standard of truth and and puts something else in its place. And that downward spiral uh, results in, in men not not worshiping nothing, but worshiping anything but the one true and living God. And Romans 1 describes men who, who are, in all, for all practical purposes, they live as if they are atheists. But we know that there is no such thing as an atheist because atheists actually worship a host of idols. And the unbeliever, the pagan idolater or the, the man who claims to be an atheist, he is not somebody who wants to not worship, neither is he somebody who doesn't worship. He's actually just somebody who worships a whole host of his own idols of his own making. And that is what Romans 1 described. They, they refuse to give honor and glory to the Creator, who is the Creator of all things, and instead exchange that glory for the glory of creation. And they worship and serve the creature or the creation rather than the Creator. And that idolatry takes all kinds of different forms, numerous types of different forms. Uh, some pagan atheists just, they worship the state. For them, government is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, the provider of all of our needs and necessities and everything we could want and every creature comfort. And that's what they look for, for, for protection and, and provision. Some pagan atheists worship nature and creation in a very bold form. And so they worship Mother Nature instead of Father God. And environmentalism is their religion. And the discovery of fossil fuels is the original sin. ExxonMobil is Satan. Al Gore is the Pope. Carbon credits are indulgences. Uh, global warming is the coming apocalypse, and recycling is like ordinances for us. Baptism and communion is something you do on a continual basis. So some people are very, very uh, brass in their worship of nature because their religion is environmentalism, and, and it becomes a substitute for the one and only true God. For some people, they're, they worship themselves. Some people worship their pride, their possessions, their reputation, their accomplishments, their job. The list goes on and on, because as John Calvin said. The human heart is an idol factory. And there is literally no end to the number or the types of idols that the human heart can churn out. Man without God is set adrift on a sea of idols, which is why uh, salvation is properly characterized in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 as turning from idols to serve the living and true God. Whether you are an atheist, an agnostic, a a global uh, uh, environment worshiper, or a state worshiper, or whatever your false religion is, when you become saved, you turn from that. You turn, in essence, from all of that idolatry to the living and true God. An atheist sets up all kinds of idols in their hearts. And one of those potential idols is the idol of pleasure. And we're looking at that last week in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. The idol of pleasure. Some people pursue pleasure as an idol or an end in itself. They seek pleasure as their highest goal, their highest good. And all a pleasure seeker is doing is, is taking God off of that throne and instead putting up on that throne their own personal enjoyment or their delight, or their pleasure in some way. And so that becomes their idol. They exchange the good of God for the good of an adrenaline rush, or a pleasure rush, or some delight that they cherish more than God. It is an exchange that goes on. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, we see Solomon pursuing, in a very hedonistic, self-centered way, pleasure, in the attempt to try and wring out of pleasure any potential meaning or purpose that he might find in pleasure. Having concluded from looking at nature, humanity, and history that everything is empty and vain and meaningless, Solomon turned in a very, to a very hedonistic path of pursuing pleasure. And that's what we started looking at last week. Now, to be clear, Solomon was not a theological atheist. He is a practical atheist. And I mentioned throughout our study of Ecclesiastes that Solomon is, is, 
is the typical expression of a man who rejects God and, and, uh, and I've likened him oftentimes to an atheist. But Solomon was not a theological atheist. He knew that God existed. He never doubted that. Uh, Solomon never in Ecclesiastes or anywhere else in Scripture ever denied that God existed or, or claimed that God didn't exist. But Solomon was a practical atheist. That is to say that as he examined life under the sun, his belief in God and the reality of God did not come into that evaluation at all. So Solomon was looking at life and all of the activities under the sun from an atheistic perspective for all intents and purposes because God has no bearing in his evaluation of any of these things that he is examining. And so it is also with his pursuit of pleasure. Now last week in verses 1 and 2 kind of introduced Solomon's pursuit of pleasure and I suggested to you that there are four realms in which Solomon pursued pleasure. And they are here given in verses 3 through the end of verse uh, 8. 3 through 8, there are four realms here. The first one is wine. Second, his works. Third, his wealth. And fourth, his women. And we'll look at each one of those four individually. His wine, his works, his wealth, and his women. But before we do that, I want you to notice three things that all four of those realms of pleasure have in common. First is this. All of these represent, in their proper use and form, a blessing from God. All of them represent a potential blessing from God. Um, Wine, in Scripture, is portrayed in the Bible as something that God gives to His people, something that makes the heart merry, something that can be used in an appropriate way, uh, something that is the symbol of God's blessing and a plentiful harvest. The same can be said of work. Work is a blessing from God. You think, well, work, what about the sweat of my brow and the thorns and the thistles? That is the curse upon work, but work was given before there was ever a curse. Work itself is a blessing. It is a good thing that comes from the hand of God. But since we live in a cursed creation, now our work involves thorns and thistles and the sweat of our brow. The same is true as wealth. The Scripture says that it is a blessing of the Lord to make one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. So financial prosperity can be a blessing from God upon the righteous. It is a curse of God upon the wicked, by the way. Psalm 73 teaches that. I've been talking about that in the, in the church newsletter. And then women, enjoying life with the wife of your youth, youth and the delights of, of marital love, that is a good thing. None of these things, whether it's a, a cup of wine or building a house or enjoying financial prosperity or having a wife and, and a woman and enjoying love together, these things are not evil in themselves. So it is wrong for us to look at Solomon's quest for pleasure in these different areas and to say, well, all of those things then must be empty and meaningless and useless. No, it's that Solomon couldn't enjoy the blessing in those things because of his vantage point and his perspective on pleasure itself. So all four of these things represent the blessing of God. Second, all four of these things are also things that can become idols very easily. We have all known people who have uh, given up everything and sacrificed everything of, of even temporal and eternal value for another cup of wine, another drink, or another day at the office, or another... Uh, another cache of possessions and wealth, or even another woman. So men are foolish enough to give up everything just to pursue the enticements of another woman. So all three of these things, all four of these things can be blessings from God. They can become idols very quickly. And this is very significant, the third one. All four of these realms of pleasure represent areas in which self-control is very difficult to maintain. Areas in which self-control is very difficult to maintain. Whether it is wine, that almost just goes without saying, right? It is using using wine in a in a in a in a uh, responsible and measured uh, sense can become very quickly devolve into drunkenness and dissipation, which Scripture condemns unequivocally. Uh, second, works what can start off as a job and earning for your family and desiring to work forty hours a week can very soon quickly become. Uh, an overindulgence, and you, men can easily lose self-control and start working 80 to 100 hours a week on this, but get something else and get lost in that, and it can ruin families and, and ruin marriages. And so it is also with wealth. Desire to have just a little bit more can desire to have just a little bit more, and before long you have somebody who has fallen into the trap of, of love, loving money and drowned themselves in perdition and all kinds of ruin just because they love the gold. And so it is also with women. Uh, the sexual drive, particularly in men, is very difficult to harness. And the pornography that is so uh, uh, readily pre- prevalent and available in our age is a curse on this nation. It is the judgment of God on this nation. And the lack of self-control and discipline that many people have in regards to their passions leads them into destruction and destroys them lo- their lives. So all four of these areas are areas in which it is very difficult to maintain self-control. 
Now, and, and what about Solomon? Did Solomon exercise self-control in these things? No, as we're going to work our way through his wine, his works, his wealth, and his women, you will see that Solomon went to extremes in all of these areas, again in an attempt to wring pleasure for all it is worth to see if there is some meaning or purpose or profit in all of the pleasure that he could bring himself. So now let's look first at wine. Verse 3. Let's read verse 3 together. I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. Now, there's no statement in this text as to whether or not wine is a good thing or a bad thing. Solomon is just describing how he used wine in an attempt to cheer his body and to bring himself pleasure. Uh, using wine in that context, and it, but Solomon is not stating whether wine is good or bad, but using wine in the way that Solomon did, to use it to pursue pleasure as an end in itself, that is an abuse of wine. Now, Scripture has a lot of good things to say about wine, which is all alcoholic beverages, but it also has a lot of caution and bad things to say about wine. And it is not right, and it doesn't stand up hermeneutically to say every bad reference to wine in Scripture describes alcohol, every good reference to wine in Scripture describes grape juice. Right? That is not doesn't hold up hermeneutically. And so there are good things that Scripture says about wine and the proper use of wine, a perspective on that, and there are bad things that Scripture says about wine, and again, drunkenness and dissipation and excess in that area is unequivocally condemned. Drunkenness is always sin. Scripture has nothing good to say about dissipation or drunkenness in the use of wine. So for Solomon, what was it? Did he use wine wisely because he enjoyed a nice white wine with his lamb chop? I don't know if you use white wine or red wine. I'm not a connoisseur of any of that, so I don't know if that was appropriate or not. Or did Solomon dive off into excess and go to extremes? I think that the text here represents that he did both. And I want you to notice, in verse 3, Solomon says, I explored with my mind. Now twice, Solomon refers to his mind and how his mind guided his exploration of wine. I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely. That represents a, a wise, a measured, a responsible use of wine in its context. Solomon is, is not somebody just diving off into extremes without any kind of rationality behind it. Um, the word how, how to cheer my body or stimulate my body, depending on what translation you're using, that word means to grab onto something and kind of pull it along. And it has the sense of intentionality, as if Solomon, with his mind, was laying hold of his body and dragging his body into this experiment to use this in such a way as to then evaluate it with his mind, evaluating whether my experience with wine and my use of wine was sufficient to bring me profit and advantage and pleasure under the sun. So he's looking for meaning in this, but the use of his mind two times there refers to, I think, a wise and measured use of wine in that, in that context. But then Solomon didn't stop there. The next phrase seems to suggest that Solomon plunged past that responsible use into an abuse of wine. In verse 3, he says, while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly. So there, there are two, there are two things that Solomon did with his body. He, with the use of wine. He used wine with his mind, bringing it along, his body along, and he explored how to take hold of folly. And in the context of describing here his use of wine, I think that that describes drunkenness. What does folly in terms of the use of wine look like? Proverbs chapter 20. Verse 1 says, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. That's one of the warnings about wine in Scripture. So what does the use of wine look like for a fool? It's dissipation and drunkenness. It's going to extremes. It's using and abusing a good gift that God has given in, in a way that is inappropriate. And that, I believe, is what Solomon did here when he says that I also discovered how to lay hold of folly. So he used it wisely, but he also used it and abused it. But when you think of Solomon abusing wine, don't think of Solomon staggering around the palace with his bottle in his brown paper bag, uh, slurring his words and, and drinking incoherently, wasting away in Margaritaville looking for his lost shaker of salt. That's not the type of pursuit that Solomon was on. Rather, even in the use, in the extreme use of wine, this was done with rationality in that he abused it and overused it and then stepped back and evaluated the abuse of it. Is there even any profit in going to the extreme with this? He wasn't a lush who drank uncontrollably. He did take it to extremes, but even that extreme was evaluated for its benefit and its profit. 
in terms of its ple- in terms of its pleasure. And so with that in mind, then how did Solomon, what did Solomon conclude about the use and the abuse of wine? Is there any profit in it? In, in using wine to cheer the body or even in going to extremes with it? Look at the end of verse three. He took hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under the few year, under heaven, the few years of their lives. We find out at the end of the passage that this too was vanity, even the striving, uh, even striving after wind, and there was no profit to it under the sun. And so Solomon, this whole evaluation is done for the purpose of discovering, is there any profit in this realm of pleasure, in the use of wine? Is there any profit in that? And Solomon comes to the conclusion that there is no profit in that use of wine, and even in the abuse of wine. And the the reference at the end of verse 3 is the very first time in this book that Solomon mentions the shortness of life. Notice that there, he's going to return to this theme again and again throughout Ecclesiastes. But here's the first time he mentions the few years of our living on this earth. I think it must have vexed Solomon and upset him at some point as he's writing this at the end of his life. It must have vexed him in some way to, to come to the realization that life is short and that he spent so much of that very short life pursuing the things that he pursued in this passage. That had to have been disappointing for Solomon. And so he, he mentions it here. Of all the things that I could have pursued, I pursued wine just to see if there's any use to it in my short years on this planet. Turns out there was none. Let's look at the second one, his works. Verse 4. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves. And I, uh, sorry, that's verse 7. That's with his, uh, his wealth. So verse 6 ends his, his pursuit of his works, his enlargement of his works. Solomon's building programs, even by today's standards, would have been enormous and quite impressive. Quite impressive. He built houses. He built summer homes and winter homes. He built palaces. He built houses for his wives, Scripture says. He also built idol houses for the idols of his foreign wives, Scripture says. Solomon was a man who liked to build. In fact, Scripture describes some of his building projects in 1 Kings chapter 7. And here's what it says. Now Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished all his house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, and its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits, on four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams on the pillars. It was paneled with cedar above and the side chambers, which were on the 45 pillars, 15 in each row. There were artistic window frames in three rows, and window was opposite window in three ranks. All the doorways and the doorposts had squared artistic frames, and window was opposite window in three ranks. Then he made the halls of pillars, a uh, hall of pillars, its length was 50 cubits, and its width 30 cubits, and a porch was in front of them, and pillars, and a threshold in front of them. He made the hall of the throne where he was to judge, the hall of judgment, and it was paneled with cedar from floor to floor. His house where he was to live, the outer court, inward from the hall, was of the same workmanship. He also made a house like this for, for all of, for Pharaoh's daughter, whom Solomon had married. All these were of costly stones, of stone cut according to measure, sawed with saws, inside and outside, even from the foundation to the coping and so on, the outside of the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, even large stones, stones of ten cubits and stones of eight cubits, and above were costly stones, stone cut according to measure, and cedar. So the great court all around had three rows of cut stone and a row of cedar beams, even as the inner court of the house of the Lord and the porch of the house. And you almost get the sense that the man who wrote that got to a point where he just said, I am without words to describe this, right? It could go on and on and on and on and on. It was quite a lavish building program that Solomon engaged in. Second Chronicles 8, 3 through 6 says Solomon went to Hazmoth, Zobah, and captured it. He built Tadmor in the wilderness. Now these are cities that he built. Cities. Tadmor in the wilderness and all the storage cities which he had built in Hamath. He also built Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon. Fortified cities with walls, gates, and bars, and Belath, and all the storage cities that Solomon had, and all the cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen, and all that it pleased Solomon to build in Jerusalem, and Lebanon, and in all the land under his rule. This is an enormous building project. An enormous building project that Solomon was engaged in. And his, his building project was not just architectural, but also agricultural. He planted gardens and parks. Look at verse 5. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, which irrigate a forest of growing trees. When I read that passage, I always think to uh, something I saw while I was traveling one time. Uh, a few years ago, a family member paid for Deidre and I to go to Vienna, Austria. 
And one of the things that we did during our one week time in Vienna was to visit a, a palace that was outside. It was then outside of or on the outskirts of Vienna, and yet it was still kind of surrounded by city. But back when the time when it was built, that is enormous estate would have been way out in the country, away from the city. But now hundreds of years later, it's in almost looks like downtown Vienna. So this, there's this massive palace in which uh, Napoleon Bonaparte stayed and Mozart played for one of the queens there. I don't even know where queen. I don't even remember the name of the palace. I was just overawed by what was there and what I saw. And part of that enormous estate, equally impressive with the building, was all of the landscaping around it. It was hundreds of acres, and this is not an exaggeration, hundreds of acres of finely manicured lawns, gravel pathways, parks, gardens, hedges, flower beds, ponds, uh, every little, I mean, you could travel to any part of the exterior of this castle, and it was like a, a different theme entirely with what was there. And it took numerous people just to maintain that all year round. And this, they said, was like it was back when it was built. It was that big and that beautiful and that ornate. That is what I picture when I think of Solomon building in Jerusalem. He built his own house, and then he surrounded it with all of this luxury that he describes here. And then his summer home, surrounded by luxury, like he describes here. This is an enormous building project. Now, some of you would listen to this and you say, no, that doesn't sound pleasurable to me at all. Right? I would much rather just find a beach somewhere, go sit down, kick my feet up, and read a good book. Do something other than all of that building. So how is that pleasurable? Well, for Solomon, it obviously was the pursuit of pleasure. Now, I know that not... In fact, this is a pursuit of pleasure in two ways. I know that not all men are like this, but most men, the vast majority of men, understand what I mean when I say this, that men like to build things and create things, and they like to, when they get to the end of the day or the end of the week, to be able to look upon what their hands have made. There's something satisfying in that, that men enjoy doing that. They enjoy contributing to something that they can see the fruits of their labor. And for some men, this becomes that, that satisfaction becomes very addictive. And men can pursue that in a desire to build still more and more and build towers and build parks and put my name on it and have it an accomplishment and a monument to myself. That sense of satisfaction in building can become addictive. And just and, and that itself can become an idol that men pursue, even in their work, in working more and more and longer and longer hours and eventually trying to build an empire for themselves at work. And so men enjoy pleasure out of that in some in, in a number of different ways. Um, Maybe even the thought that if I just had a summer home or if I just had a cabin or if I just had an addition or if I just had more landscaping or if it just a bigger yard or maybe another piece of property or another home to go to or whatever it is. Just the idea that you want more and more in order to satisfy that. And Solomon wanted more and more and he took delight in creating these things. And this is not to say that Solomon himself was out there swinging the axe and running the shovel, but he oversaw all of these building projects. It was all under his, his purview. The second way that you can delight in building something like that is that once it is built, you get to enjoy it. So you can imagine that Solomon would build these parks and these gardens and, and, and all of these forests of growing trees and enjoy the fruit trees. There is a certain delight and pleasure in being able to go out and roll around in the grass and sit next to the p- pond that you built and enjoy the grass that you planted and enjoy the fruit trees and sit under them in the shade and just relax, if Solomon even had time to relax with all that building going on. But those are the ways that men can delight even in a building project like Solomon describes here. Now, there are two things that are unique here in Solomon's description of his building projects that I want you to notice. The first, Solomon uses language that seems borrowed from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 in God's creation account of the Edenic, peri- uh, the Edenic par- paradise in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Solomon uses words like planted and built and watered and made that language, those are words used um, by how God crea- of how God created the first paradise in Eden. And furthermore, Solomon refers to his gardens, and he uses the same word for garden that is used of the Garden of Eden, and he uses that phrase, all kinds of fruit trees, and that's used, I think, three different times in Genesis 1 and 2 to describe God planting trees and making trees in the Garden of Eden. And this has led some people to suggest that as Solomon is describing this, what he is, what he is admitting to or describing is his own attempts to recreate a paradise for himself. And this would make sense in light of Solomon's view, his perspective. Because Solomon may have been thinking about or pondering the early chapters of Genesis and wondered to himself, what would it be like to enjoy a creation before vanity set in? Before meaninglessness took over? Before the curse came and now saps everything that I do of meaning and significance? This this may be Solomon describing his own attempt at creating for himself an environment secluded from everything else as if to enjoy without the effects of the fall, this 
this creation as it would have existed in Eden. But you can't do that, can you? Because there's no place in the world you can go. There's no place in the universe you can go that you can escape the curse, that you can escape this vanity. So even all of this building project for Solomon was vain. And notice that he did it for himself. Everything was for himself. These weren't public works. This wasn't what he did for the nation of Israel, for the people to enjoy. These are his own personal parks and ponds and gardens, etc. The second thing I want you to notice that's significant here is there is something missing in Solomon's list of building accomplishments. And it is not immediately visible to your eye, but once you notice that it's missing, all of a sudden you realize that it speaks volumes. What building was Solomon most known for? In fact, it was named after him. It's called Solomon's Temple. And that was, in fact, after he became king, his very first building project. It took him seven years to build the temple for God, known as Solomon's Temple. But it took him 13 years to build his own palace. And what does that say about Solomon's priorities by the time he got done with the temple? And I suspect that by the time we get to the end of Ecclesiastes, the significance and the centrality of the temple was a long way from Solomon's mind. It wasn't even, doesn't even make it on his list of building accomplishments. Where for us, we would think that that should have been his most significant accomplishment. And having done that, he should have been content with that. But he wasn't. So that is his works. That is his works. And by the way, today, what is left of Solomon's works? You can go to Jerusalem and there's portions of a pool that date back to Solomon's time. Uh, there's a portico, the remnants of Solomon's portico that is there, is there in Jerusalem today. And a few other things that are noted for being belonging to Solomon and being part of that. But for the most part, his entire building project, all of his building programs, all of it has been buried by the, in the sands of time, lost to history. This Time has marched on, and all that is left is a hollowed out shell of, shell of what Solomon originally did. And it is stripped of its glory for sure. All right, so that is his works. So he sought pleasure in his wine in his works, and now look at his wealth, beginning in verse uh, 7. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. That means that Solomon purchased slaves from abroad, probably foreign nations, maybe even slaves that were, uh, that were Jews. And he purchased those slaves, and they served him in his temple, and in his, in his court, and in his home, and as part of his all that it took to run his kingdom. So Solomon had those slaves, and then he refers to having home-born slaves. That means that The slaves whom Solomon purchased would have children, and those children would belong to Solomon, not in the sense that he sired them, but in the sense that they would be his personal slaves as well. So he had slaves that he purchased and slaves that were born in his house who were his own. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. And back in that time, in a very agrarian culture, flocks and herds were a measure of one's wealth. You remember that Job, uh, Job's wealth is counted in terms of how many animals he had. So the same with Abraham and others. In an agrarian culture like that, having large flocks and herds is a a significant signal of one's wealth and one's ability to provide for all of those animals because you'd have to own the land or at least be able to rent the land upon which to graze all of these significant flocks and herds. Also, I possessed uh, flocks and herds larger than all who were in Jerusalem before me. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. The treasure of kings and provinces there refers to the tributes that Solomon would have received from other nations over which he ruled, and uh, kings and other governors would have sent him tribute, and this all contributed to Solomon's treasury. And he brought in an enormous amount of wealth. And again, First Kings chapter 10 describes this. Now the weight of gold which came into Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that, from the traders and the wares of the merchants and all the kings of the Arabs and the governors of the country, King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold using 600 shekels of gold on each large shield. He made 300 shekels of beaten gold using three minas of gold on each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold. There were six steps to the throne and a round top to the throne at its rear, and arms on each side of the seat, and two lions standing beside the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps, on the one side and on the other. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. All the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None was of silver. It was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon. For the king had at sea the ships of Tarshish, which the ships of Hiram, once every three years, 
And the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses, mules, and so much year by year. Second Chronicles 9.27 says, The king made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem, and he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the lowland. That was his wealth. And look what he describes in, in verse 8. I also collected for myself silver and gold, the treasures of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers. As a man had the, uh, the wealth to hire a personal concert whenever he wanted, male and female singers. Have you ever realized, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, that you and I today, in spite of the fact that we don't have the kind of wealth that I just read of here, you and I today live more comfortably and more conveniently than Solomon ever hoped or dreamed of? Back then, having music in your house, being played in your music, having music played inside of your house was a, a grace or a benefit, a blessing available only to some of the most super wealthy. That are people who had musical abilities back then, but even then, the purchase of uh, musical instruments would have, would have been costly. But today, I can, I, mean, I can carry 30,000 songs around on my phone in my pocket. I can put in my earbuds and have a high fidelity concert of my own choosing from any artist in the face of the planet pumped into my ears while I wander around my yard or drive to work or do anything else that I want to do. Back then, Solomon had the money to buy male and female singers who would entertain him. And by the way, probably try and distract him from the vexing vanity of the monotonous life that Solomon lived. He he needed even the singers to distract him from that. So that is his wealth. Now I want you to look at his women. Verse 8, the last part of verse 8. And the pleasures of men, many concubines. Now, if you're reading an older translation, a King James or a New King James, you're probably asking yourself, where is he reading about concubines in the text? Because your King James, your New King James doesn't mention concubines at all, does it? So you're probably wondering what I'm making out of something that's not there. The New King James translation renders the verse this way, and the King James is similar to it. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. Musical instruments. And why does the, some of the older translations translate it as musical instruments, but some of the newer translations, like the ESV, the King, uh, the, the NASB, and the NIV translate it as harem or concubines? is because the word that is translated concubines there is a very rare word. In fact, it only occurs here in this verse, in this passage. And so its meaning for years has not been all of that clear. And it seems as if the older translators um, read that word and assumed that it must have something to do with the male and female singers that he mentions earlier in the middle of the verse. And so not knowing exactly what that word meant or how it was used, they assumed that it had something to do with the singing, the male and the female singers, and so they translated it as musical instruments. That, I think, is my my best guess as to how it was translated that way. But the word actually speaks of a concubines or of a harem. Now, what I am about to say, I am intending to be clear and not at all intending to be crass. And I'm not going to be crass. I'm going to be very measured in what I say. This always, whenever I say something like this, I can tell it makes my wife very uncomfortable. I'm going to be clear and not crass. The word that is translated as concubine here is a word that is very similar to and related to the Hebrew word that speaks of the breast, the body part. So that is why it is translated as concubine or harems here. Uh, Solomon is, and he's not even using the, the, he's not even using the actual word that is translated or for breast or that body part. He is using a, a variation on that word and one that suggests that he may have been using something that was a vulgar part of the vernacular, a slang or kind of a derogatory reference to that body part. So he is saying here, I even had for myself the pleasures of men, abundant breasts. That is how, that is what he is doing. Now, keep in mind that this, you are getting a glimpse at how Solomon viewed women at this point in his life that he would refer to women that way. Because a concubine, a, a collection of concubines or a concubine, a harem, existed for only one purpose, and that was to bring pleasure to the man. That's all that they didn't have the same rights as the wives. They weren't viewed in that stature. They existed for one reason and one reason only, and that was it. But here he is describing them in a very vulgar uh, sense, in a very a slang way. If Solomon was known for anything other than the temple, it is the the abundant women that he had at his side on a continual basis. 
First Kings 11, 1 through 3 says, Now Solomon, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, You shall not associate with them, nor, uh, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. 700 wives, 300 concubines. That is, that is a historical statement. That is not an exaggeration. A thousand women at his disposal. To put that into perspective, Solomon could go to bed with a different woman every night for two years and nine months and never see the same woman twice. That is unbelievable. So did, did Solomon dive off into that area of pleasure? Yeah, he did. Because Solomon bought the lie that if he just had another woman, or another woman after another woman, after another woman, or any other woman, rather than the one that God had given to him, he bought the lie that if he had that, he could be satisfied, he would be content, that it would be enough. But it never was. And a lot of foolish men believe that lie. Does your browser history, would it reveal to the world that you have believed that lie as well? Does your browser history contain a harem of women that would rival Solomon's? It's a tough question. Many men have believed that. If I just had another woman, then I would be satisfied. No, you wouldn't. That is a lie. Fool, don't believe it. Don't believe it for a moment. None of these things brought Solomon satisfaction. None of them. Did Solomon have a good time? Oh, yeah, he had a good time. A mind-boggling good time. He, he engaged in and enjoyed all of these pleasures, not... Not chronologically one right after another in a sequence, but probably all four of these at the same time in abundance beyond what our minds can imagine or even hope to imagine, and yet none of it satisfied because Solomon says at the end of it, it was all vanity and chasing after the wind and there was no profit to it under the sun. The desire to pursue pleasure and think that that brings meaning and satisfaction and significance and lasting contentment, the desire to do that and to pursue pleasure in all of these areas is as old as Solomon and it is as new as yesterday's headlines. Because not only have many men and many women been lured away into destruction because of this pursuit of these pleasures, but also many nations have been destroyed by the pursuit of these same pleasures. And I want you to understand that Solomon's pursuit of these women, it was a violation of his marriage covenant. Atheists and skeptics and people who doubt the Bible and trying to rewrite what the Bible says about marriage will often point to something like this and say the Bible makes room for all kinds of different marriages arrangements, just like polygamy. And so the, the type of marriage that we want to put into place is the same type of marriage. It's just another kind of marriage like all the different types of marriages that, that Solomon enjoyed and that Abraham enjoyed and that Jacob enjoyed and all the other polygamists in Scripture. But this is not God's design. This is a violation of his marriage covenant. Solomon had one woman at one time. It's the Song of Solomon. And it's the picture of a beautiful marriage love in its appropriate context and how he felt about her and how she felt about him. But at some point, we don't know when, but at some point, that was not enough for Solomon. And if you think that one more woman will be enough for you, you're buying the same lie that Solomon bought. You know why Solomon had a thousand wives? Because 999 was not enough. And you know why 999 was not enough? Because one was not enough. Just as the eye is not see it filled with seeing and the ear is not filled with hearing, Man will never be satisfied with pleasure. We're insatiable. And we cannot find meaning and significance in any of those things. So I know that that was heavy. But it ought to be. And I covered all of that for this reason. All of it in one sitting for this reason. I want you to get a sense of the, the taxing busyness that Solomon in this pursuit of pleasure endured. It's one thing after another to degrees that we cannot imagine and yet he exhausted all of these avenues, all of these revenues, all of these uh, all of these places and positions and 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 passions and and everything after this pleasure. Everything that he did, he did to satisfy himself. And yet, if Solomon cannot be satisfied with all of that, you will never and I will never be satisfied with even just a little bit more than what we have, because our satisfaction is not in those things, and it can never be in those things. We have to make our satisfaction in God and in Christ and what He has done. And realize that in this world we will never be satisfied with anything. And to pursue that by any means, even if it's pleasure, is a fool's errand. Because pleasure is notoriously elusive. 
Now, next week, as I promised, we will go through a biblical perspective of pleasure and enjoyment and how God views those things. And we will look at the results of Solomon's quest for uh, meaning and pleasure in verses 9 through 11. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, our satisfaction must rest in you, and you have given to us uh, all that we do enjoy in this life for our enjoyment. And we thank you for that blessing and help us to see in those things a picture of your love and receive these blessings in a way that you have designed them to be in the context you have designed them to be enjoyed. We love you and we thank you for the grace that you have shown us. And we pray that you would protect us and guard us from ever seeking our satisfaction in other things. May we not be, as Solomon was, a practical atheist and create idols in our own hearts that we pursue to our own destruction. May we find our satisfaction in Christ and in Christ alone. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.